everyone, and welcome to the BEAM Learning Month. Um, this meetup is being recorded, and in this edition, we'll, we will be hearing um, Windows from Open to Close, presented by Ig Ignacio San Jose. Um, before we begin, I'd like to cover some housekeeping items. You can access this meeting agenda with the link provided in the chat. We will hear first from our presenter, and then you will have time for Q&A. Please use the reaction button feature in Zoom to raise your hand so we can take you off mute. We encourage you all to interact with our speakers as well as each other in the chat. During the Q&A, you'll be able to ask your questions by raising your hand with the raise the hand feature and we will let you ask your question by coming off mute. Otherwise, you can also ask questions in the chat throughout the talk and we will read those out loud at the end. You can learn more about the Apache Beam project by joining our Slack channel and by visiting the website. We will place both of these links in the chat for you. Without further ado, it is my pleasure right now to introduce Ignacio San Jose. Hi, everyone. How, how is everyone doing? Let me share the screen first so we get. OK, so how is everyone doing? I'm Inigo San Jose. I'm a technical solutions engineer at Google, and I'm very happy to be here with you uh, talking in Apache Beam Learning Month, and I want to talk about Windows. Windows has been a pain point for many users in, in Beam, especially for new ones. And the idea of the talk is just to go through the very basics, like signing, like normal Windows, and then we will move, move to uh, more advanced concepts like triggers, allow uh, late data, and even custom Windows. Since this session is around one hour long, uh, I cannot go into detail uh, of everything, but the idea is again just to have an overview of pretty much everything, and then you can move off, move on from from there. So the agenda for the session is uh, what are windows and the definition and the build and building uh, windows. Then we will move to late data and triggers custom windows, and then uh, after that, we will have like a 50 minutes demo, depending how much time it takes me to go through the slides. So let's start. What are windows? The definition, uh, motivation, and building windows. So windows are a way of subdividing a collection depending on the timestamp. Uh, when we aggregate uh, elements, we might need to use the timestamp as an aggregation uh, way. And the windows work both on, on on, on the, the key as in, in a global way. So uh, the reason behind Windows is, apart from being able to, to aggregate using the timestamp, is that when we're using streaming, we need them. So let's say that I'm going to aggregate a bounded data. So something that we know when it starts and when it ends. I can aggregate without doing anything. I just not aggregate everything that starts uh, from the start and from the end, and that should be it. Let's say like I, I'm going to count the number of lines in a text file. I can do it right away. But if we have a stream of data that is infinite, like let's say I'm reading from Kafka or Pubsa, I have some bounded data, I need a way to tell the system when I'm going to stop counting. So uh, I can say like, okay, I'm going to subdivide my stream of data in an hour chunk. So from 12 to one, I subdivide it and I count the number of lines that I have uh, during this time. And that's why, why we have Windows, and especially we have Windows in, in Stream. We have four building windows in Apache Beam. We have fixed, fixed windows, sliding, session, and global. Let me show you in more detail what each one of them does. So fixed windows represent a consistent duration without any overlap in our stream of data. So the idea here is that I want to uh, split my data in pieces of, of time without any overlap of them. So I want to count how many uh, customers came to my store in one, one whole day. I will use a, a fixed window. I want to sum all, all the tickets that I sold for a particular concert or something. In, in, I, I will use a, a fixed window. So, um, the idea is that the elements themselves don't have any overlap and the windows themselves don't have any overlaps. So for example, here, you say, like, I want to have a, a window of, of one hour. So all the elements that belong, that have the timestamp from 12 to 1, they will go in the same window. From 1 to 2, they will go into the same window. For example, here, this element, these elements here belong to this window. These elements here belong to this window. So when we aggregate, we just take those elements belonging to that particular window. 
I come to show you an aggregation here, which is count, very simple, very straight away. Um, so the first window, we're going to get two elements. The second window, we're going to get four. And the third window, we're going to get three. So just the elements that belong to, to this particular box. Sliding windows, they also represent time intervals in our data stream. But in this case, we do have overlap. So the idea here is that I'm going to create uh, windows that are a given size long, but I'm going to create it with a given period. So for example, I'm going to create windows that are one hour long, but I'm going to create it every 30 minutes. So I will have a window that goes from 12 to 1. I will have another window that goes from 12.30 to 1.30, from 1 to 2, from 1.30 to 2.30. So for example, here, this element here that we have here will belong to two windows. It will belong to the dotted window that we have over here. And it will also belong to the window that it's with like normal line. And, that, and we will create another one here and so on. We will create windows with a given period of 30 minutes. So they are overlapping with each other. If we do the count again, we will get for the first window, we will get two elements, which will be these two. The second window will also be two elements, but it will take all of this. Uh, green means that it's a fired window from the dot one, and yellow means from the normal one. Uh, we get the third window, which will be this one here, also two. And now the, the fourth one, which would be this one here, actually have four elements. So these elements here have belonged to the window over here, and they have also belonged to the window over here. And let's continue with the count. Now four, three, and lastly one. OK, so that was pretty simple. Let's move to session windows. In the session windows, instead of being defined by uh, time itself, they are defined by the data. So the idea here is that we will create a window. And depending when the previous element with the same key happened, we will those elements will belong to the same window or not. So we get one element. We get the next one with the same key. And if those elements are apart less than one gap that we defined, those two windows are going to belong together. And we keep doing that and that. So the, the size uh, of the window will depend on the data, not only on the time. You have an example here. Of, of some elements, and we can see uh, that the size is different. In this case, the gap of one hour is what I represented with this white line over here. So those two elements will be less than one hour apart, the same with this one. And now this one and this one are more than one hour apart, so they belong to a different window. I want to show you with a little bit more of detail this, so let me give you a better example. So uh, let's say I have one element coming at 12.35. So my window now, my session window, is going to go from 12.35 to 1.35. We get a new element that arrives at 12.45. Since it's less than one hour apart, it's less than this uh, white line, we expand our window, we merge the windows, and they go now up to uh, 1.45. We get a new element. This one comes at 1.40, and we again expand the window up to 240. Notice that this particular element here that arrived at 140 wouldn't have belonged to the same window that the first one. So if we go back to slides, the first window was from 1235 to 135. But since we had the middle element here that expanded our window up to uh, 145, uh, 145, the new element here did belong to the same window. So now we have a window that goes up to uh, 240. And when the new element comes, it's more than one hour apart. So we close the window, and we fire the elements that we have there. This new element will create its own new window that will go from 310 to 410. And that will be it. It's very important here that the system window uh, works in a key value basis. So in this case, I want to show you how it will actually look like. I have created three windows for three keys, red, yellow, and green. And as you can see, they work in a different way. So for example, this uh, red uh, element here doesn't belong to the same window of, of the, the yellow one, of course. And you have to do the same operation that we've been doing um, in the previous slides with all the keys and all the elements that belong to those keys. 
Now, the global window is the last window I wanted, so the, the last window of the build one once, uh, and it's the default one. So all the elements are assigned to it by default. And if you want to check, change this window, you will need to reapply a new window um, in your code. So the idea of, of this is like, the way I, I would think about it is like an infinite size fixed window. So it will go from minus infinite to plus infinite. And that's why all the elements belong to it. And when we want to aggregate data using this global window, which is exactly the same as the, the first, uh, the, the, the motivation for windows in streaming, we will need to have some triggers. I will talk about triggers later as, as promised. Um, but yeah, just for you to get the idea that this is the default window and it goes from minus infinite to plus infinite. It's going to lay data and triggers. First, I want to show you some concepts that I think are important for you to get the idea. Then we will move to lay data and then to, to triggers. So on the right, we have one graph that has on the X axis event time and on the Y axis processing time. Event time is when the data actually occurs, when the, the timestamp that the element has by itself. And this is the timestamp that the windows use to determine to which window this element belongs to. Uh, so for example, if we are reading from pubs up of, of Kafka, the event time will be determined by the, by the source itself. And processing time will be when our system knows about this, um, about this element. Just to give you an example, let's say I'm ordering pizza and I call them and say like, hey, I want a uh, four cheese pizza. That will be the event time when I order it. And the moment I get the pizza into my house, it will be the processing time. And the difference between those will be the watermark for that particular element. And the watermark, like the actual definition of watermark is taking all the elements, all the orders yeah, that we have and measure the maximum difference between the event time and the processing time. So again, using the pizza example, one particular pizza store, one particular pizza place has different orders at a given point and the watermark reads 10 minutes. This will tell them that the order that is, uh, that is taking the longest to, to deliver, the, the, the order that it's the latest is 10 minutes. This doesn't mean, and this is very important, that the orders that were before 10 minutes weren't, weren't delivered, but this means that there are not any order that was below 10 minutes, uh, that is later than 10 minutes. So going, coming back to, to the graph, in the x equal y line, this will be the ideal uh, scenario. So any element has, all the elements have, have zero latency, and of course this doesn't happen. So we, we will get something like this. We will get the green curve here. That is what actually happens. And what we have on the difference here will be the actual watermark. And the elements can belong to some, some place like this or like this. So it, this will be, again, the maximum, uh, the, the element that has the maximum difference between, the difference between the timestamp and the, the processing time, the event time and the processing time, sorry. And triggers uh, are just uh, to determine when we are emitting the aggregate results for, for this window. We will cover them in some, some slides. So we know that we might get late data. What will happen if we have a window just particular at, uh, particularly at that moment? So let's say like I have one element that has timestamp, has event time uh, 1259. And the system knew about this, this element at 101. What will happen with that, with that window when we're aggregating? BIM offered us a way of allowing uh, some lateness in our system. Since we're always going to have some latency, we, we need to tell BIM how we're going to consider these late data elements just so we have completeness in, in mind. I want to show you an example of this. So on the top, we have the event time, and on the bottom, we have processing time. So for example, element one here appeared at this given point, but our system knew about it a little bit later. So this line over here would be the delay. The same with two. And now three, and this is when the thing gets interested, interesting. Uh, the event time of three is this one here. So it, it would belong to the window, but it was very late and it appeared well, way later, it appeared 
when the window was already closed. And the same with four. Again, we have the delay here. So what we can do is we can tell Beam, I'm going to wait at most 50 minutes for late data. And what will happen is this element here, since it belongs to this maximum allowed, uh, maximum allowed late data, it will be considered to our pilot. And then number four, since it, it appeared after uh, the 50 minutes that I allowed, it will be dropped. Notice that these three here and four the same, even though um, our system knew about them at this given point, they don't belong to this window over here because the event time is the of, of this window. So it appeared at that time. Um, since we're going to talk about triggers and other data, I also wanted to, to explain something called accumulation modes. Every time that we are uh, getting results for our aggregated, we call it a pain or a, when, a, when, a, when a trigger fires. And we need to tell uh, BIM how we're accumulating these, these elements. Accumulating elements means that we're going to uh, keep the elements that were fired before. And discarding them will mean that all the elements that were fired before are going to be discarded and we're only going to keep the new ones. Let me show you an example, which is probably better than the explanation I gave. So we are going to use exactly the same uh, picture that the, I capitalized before. So again, we have one and two that arrive on time, three that arrive late, but uh, within the uh, lateness that we are allowing, and four that it's dropped. So when the window closes, so at this time, at the one hour mark, we get elements one and two. And when we get this new element, three, since we're accumulating, we're going to keep one and two and add three to it. So we get one, two, and then three, because we are accumulating and this was fired late. Let's, let me show you now discarding, exactly the same, that when the window closes, we get one and two. And with the late data, now since we are discarding, we remove one and two and we only keep three. And of course, in this, is, in this example and the previous one, four is dropped. Triggers. Um, BIM uses triggers to determine when we are emitting our results. We refer to every result to as a pain or as a, a fire trigger. By default, BIM uh, fires when we are closing the window, as we, we've been seeing in the previous slide. But we can modify this trigger, just even either to get some early results or to get uh, the other results. Um, I explain why we want triggers for late results but it's not clear why we would want early, early, early results. Let's say, for example, using the story example again, that I, I want to accumulate, I want to measure how many money this particular store has been making in, in, a, in, a, in a whole day. But I want to know how at, at midday, more or less, I want to know how well is, is it doing. And if there's any issue, I would want to know it. So for that, I, I will trigger early. I will make a trigger that will happen at midday, and then I will keep all the elements to aggregate when, when the window actually closes. Con changing these triggers and how we, we do early and late uh, triggers help us control the data and balance between completeness, latency, and cost. I'm going to show you the types of triggers that we have. We have four types, event triggers, that the event time triggers that of course depend on event time, uh, this is the default trigger in, in, in Beam. When the window closes, this is something that happens on event time. Processing time triggers, as the name says, operates using processing time. Data-driven tri uh, triggers, this happens by examining the data itself and determining if we need to fire or not. At this given point, we only have uh, one type of data-driven triggers, which is after a, after a number, a certain number of elements in, in that particular trigger. And lastly, we have composite triggers, which are a way of combining the previous ones, combining event time, processing time, and data-driven triggers. So let me show you examples of each one of them. So processing time, uh, we have a trigger which is after processing time, past first element in pain, plus 10 minutes. So this means I'm going to receive the first element in, in the stream of data for that particular window. After that element arrives, I'm going to count 10 minutes and all the elements that belong to that period of 10 minutes are going to be fired together. 
very important here is that these 10 minutes are actual time, it's actual processing time. So if one element was late, it will be considered for, for these 10 minutes. Like it was late and outside the, the 10 minutes, of course. It wouldn't be considered. So in the part, the first trigger will be one, two, and three. And we do the same with the next one, four and five. We wait 10 minutes after four. Data-driven triggers, uh, we have element count three. So after pain, element count three. So we get one element, and after that, we count um, up to three elements. So one, two, and three. And when we have three elements, we fire the trigger. One important thing here is that we have to have this particular three elements. So in this scenario here, that they have only four and five, since the condition of having three elements is not met, we are not fighting this trigger. And this four and five will be lost. Uh, I will explain how to solve this issue in three slides. Uh, and lastly, event and triggers. Uh, with event and triggers, uh, the default one is after watermark pass end of window. Again, when the window closes, we fire, but we can add early firings and late firings. In this scenario, what I did is as an early firing, I modified uh, I modified it to say after processing time, plus, plus first element in pain, plus 10 minutes. So we will get one, two, and three, counting 10 minutes from one. Then we will get only four because the window closes. And then we will get the late firing, which is after pain element count. So we get five. So we will have three pains in this, this window. We'll have the first one that is happening early, one, two, and three. The second one, which will happen on time, is, it's four, happening when the window closes. And then we will have five, that will be a late trigger. And now I want to explain a bit about composite triggers. So the most important one of these is repeatedly forever. This is any time the condition of a trigger is met, we are firing the, um, the results and we are starting over. So we reset the trigger and we start over. And actually I've been lying in the previous slides. The trigger that I saw you is not the one I, I, I wrote, actually it's repeatedly forever with the trigger uh, that we had. So if we go back, for example, to this one, if the, the actual trigger here will be repeatedly forever after processing time, past, past first element in pain, plus 10 minutes. If we didn't, wouldn't have this repeatedly forever, what will happen would be, we get one element, element one, we wait 10 minutes, we get one, two, and three, and the rest of the elements will be discarded because the condition was, was already met. Adding this repeatedly forever, what it does is make this trigger happen again. So it will start over and we will get number four. This is the first element in the new pane. We count 10 minutes. And um, in order to do this repetition, we need to do the repeatedly forever. So again, repeatedly forever. Once the condition is met, we fire and we start over. After it, uh, we set uh, a list of, of triggers. And when the first one is met, we fire. When the second in the list is met, we fire and so on. With the same with the third and the fourth. So basically it's like a sequence and we do first, second, third, and so on. After first or after any in Python, it emits when one of the conditions are met. So we have, again, a list of, of triggers, a combination of them. And when any of those, those triggers, and the condition of those triggers is met, we are firing the, the trigger. And the last one is after all. So we meet when all the, in, in a list of triggers, we meet when all the triggers, all the conditions of those triggers are met. So after first or after any will be the same as an or condition. And after all will be, will be the same as an and condition. Let me show you an example of a composite trigger. So that, uh, well, I, I think this is wrong. <laughs> okay, either way. Um, so uh, the, the trigger here will be a repeated trigger after first, and we have two on our list. We have element count three and past first element plus 10 minutes. So let's see how, how this will go. We get the element one, then we start the count either for 10 minutes after the first element or the, the number of, of elements that we have in our, in, our, in our pane. We get two and we get three. So the condition of element 
count three is met, we file with that condition. The, um, the 10 minutes condition will be this dotted line here that since it happened later, we don't file, we don't file with it, we file with the previous one, which was element count. Now, since we have repeatedly forever or repeatedly, we check again for, for the new trigger. We get number four, get, then we get number five, and now we are firing using the last 10 minutes because we are never going to meet, meet the condition of after count three. We only had two elements. So we fire with this, this just these two, two elements. And now, uh, this was pretty much all for latent triggers. Now I want to show you uh, two use cases for custom windows. And you might be thinking here, okay, Inigo, but uh, you have shown us like the previous ones, the pre uh, previous windows ones. And also like we can modify the triggers with early and late results. Why would you want uh, custom windows? And this is the reason that I love Bing so much. Bing give us so much flexibility and it already has many nice features, but now you can even modify and add new things, like custom windows. So I want to show you two use cases that I was thinking around just for, for the session. The first one, data dependent fixed window. The names are very bad by the way. So this is my use case. Uh, I'm streaming data into my system from many stores across the world. I want to calculate the sales that each store made. But since I have some stores that are more important than the others, that maybe the, the revenue, the total revenue I'm gonna get, it's bigger in, it's like there's a big percentage on, on a particular store than in others. I want to get more frequent updates for those ones and less frequent updates for, for the small stores. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the messages that are coming to, to my system, the elements that are coming to my system, are going to have a number that is going to determine how big I want this window to be. So this is my the pipeline. I have a source, my custom window, and then I have my aggregation. So the element is going to be New York, a one, which is going to be the length, and $20. Now my custom window is going to check for this particular value here. And since it's a one, I'm going to create a window of one hour. Now I get a new element that's coming from Spain with a three and a hundred dollars. I check again the value, number three, so I create a window of three hours. Some of you that might be more familiar with BIM might be thinking, okay, you know, but I didn't need custom windows to, to do this. I can just create a new branch from here and have more than one a fixed window that will do exactly the same. And yeah, you're, you're right. If you know um, the stores that you have already and you're not going to change them, change them using, using that approach will work. But custom, custom windows give you the, the possibility of adding new stores right without uh, modifying absolutely anything. So if I, right now, I add a new store that is completely new, like didn't exist until now, I wouldn't need to modify the pipeline to create a new branch for this it will be able to create it automatically. The, the window will be automatically assigned by this custom window. And the second um, custom window that I want to show you is time of day dependent fixed window. Again, the name, not the best. So I'm streaming data into my system from a public transportation, uh, transportation in a city. To save resources in a downstream system, I want the aggregations to happen less frequently during night since there's going to be less people running uh, the buses and trains. So what I'm going to do is pretty much the same as before. I have my source and my custom window, then an aggregation. And what the custom window is going to do is going to get um, the element, it's going to check the system clock. I'm going to say, okay, now it's half past two. So I'm going to create a window of 30 minutes because I think half past two is a peak hour and I want to create a window of that size of at that given, at that given point. When then we get a new element at 2 a.m. I think that there's going to be less people, so I'm going to create a window of two hours. Depending the time of day, I, I can create a different window. You can do the same, of course, using weekdays, like from Monday to Friday, you create a smaller window, and we can create a bigger one or the other way around. Again, the idea here is to have uh, flexibility to do this. And no, this is not in the scope of, of the session, but there's even another way of creating even more customized uh, windows, which is called stateful do functions. I don't want, I'm not going to talk about them because they will take forever. 
but just maybe just for you to know the name, maybe it's good enough. And with this, I'm going to move to the demo. Let me just change the slide. I hope this is big enough. Let's hope. So yeah, just going to show you a little bit of how to do the things I've been talking about. Let me first import, I think it's going to be using. And the first thing here is uh, to show you the defaults on Beam and also how we're going to visualize everything. So what I'm going to do is just create one element, some elements, 0, 10, and 20 as strings. In order to do that, I'm using the btransform create. I'm going to be using interactive runners since it gives us this nice feature that uh, we can see the, the, the data about the window itself. Let me, let me run the Python so you can see what I, what I mean. So we can visualize now th things very nicely. So we get 0, 10, and 20. And now the event time, the timestamp of the element, we can see that it says mean timestamp. This is because by default, uh, in, a, in, in a batch pipeline, the, the timestamp assigned to the, to the element is minus infinite, which is the same as minimum timestamp. We can modify it, and we will see uh, how to do it in a second. Uh, for a streaming, generally, the data already has a timestamp assigned to it because it's assigned by the source. Again, I think I said at the very beginning, for pubs up, the timestamp will be when the message was published. And we can see here that the window assigned to this particular element was a global window. Now let's see how we can change the timestamp to of the element. So again, we create 0, 10, and 20. And now what we're doing is using timestamp value to assign the, the, um, the timestamp to, to this particular element. So timestamp value takes two parameters. The first one is the element that it's going through the pipeline. So in this case, just the element itself, I'm using a lambda function. And the, the timestamp, that the second parameter is the timestamp. In this case, since I'm using the strings, I'm just going to make them an integer, and that will be the, the element, the timestamp assigned to, to the element. So let me run it. And we get element zero, has timestamp zero. Of course, uh, the timestamp here is in Unix. So timestamp zero will be the first of January of 1970. That's why we get this date over here, in case any of you were surprised about it. So we get this event time being zero. For 10, we get timestamp 10. And for 20, we get timestamp 20. In case, and again, we keep using uh, global windows because we didn't change it. If we want to change it, we need to add a window into and the window that we want to use. In this case, I'm using a fixed window of 10 seconds. So let me just run it, and we can see what happens. So now we get element zero, event time zero, and the window, since it's 10, 10 seconds, it's going to go from zero to 10. So we get the start of the window zero, zero, and the duration 10 seconds. And the same from 10, from 10 to 20, and the same from 20, from 20 to 30. And if I change this 20 to 25, for example, I will get exactly the same. So this will be timestamp 25, but now the window is still 20 to 30. So the windows start from, from Unix time and you get the multiples of, of it. Now, let's, let me show you some how to actually use fixed and sli uh, sliding windows. So what I'm going to do is create some key values. Uh, the key is going to be either A or B. And the second, uh, the value of the, of the key value is going to be the timestamp that is going to be assigned to it using timestamp values. So after the assigning the, the timestamp value, I'm just doing a window and then aggregating using a group by key. So let's run the cell. And we get this, let me just order it. So the first window goes from zero to, to from minute zero to minute one. So we will get 10 and 40, because again, this is seconds. The same with B, 20 and 50. They are separated windows because they are separated keys, and we're using group by key. And the other one will be for the second window from minute one to minute two. A will have 70, and B will have 60. If I change this to a sliding windows, sliding windows of 60 seconds, and I'm going to create them with a period of 30. I think I added one space. Now what I'm going to get is 
the declaration using different windows. So let me order this again. So the first element A and B will belong to, to this time, like uh, 11, 59, 30 seconds, up to 30 seconds in, in the 1st of January. Uh, so it will be from minus 30 to plus 30 using Unix time. Uh, Unix time. So we get 10, we get 20. Now we get again the same element 10 from the previous one, because this time it will go from zero to one minute, do the same with B. And then we get uh, the, the, the next window, which will be from second 30 to minute 30 to one minute 30 and so on. And important to notice here that this element 40, for example, belong to the window from zero to one. And it also belongs to the window from 30 to, to one minute 30. So it will be from 30 to, six, to 90 in, 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 in using Unix. And it will also go from zero to 60. So we have it, uh, we have used it twice the same, the same thing. That's why we have this, this overlap. Uh, now I want to show you session windows. So what I have here is again, key values A and B, and I create them just together so they're more easy to visualize. And the idea here is that I'm going to create a gap of 60 seconds. So if the elements are less than 60 seconds apart, they're going to belong to the same window. So for example, 0 and 30 are going to belong to the same window, uh, the same with 40. And now the next one, which is 110, since it's more than one minute apart, is going to belong to a different window. Let's run this and see what happens. So we get 0, 30, and, nine, and 40, since they are less than 60 minutes apart from in order, of course. Then we get 110 and 130, again, less than 60 minutes apart. And so on, the same with B. And as you can see, we will get one window, one trigger for, for each key. And if I change this to, let's say, 80, now these are less than 60 minutes apart and also these ones. So now we're going to get everything together. Everything with the A is going to be together. Because again, if we check element to element, they are less than 60 minutes apart. And we get the duration, by the way. Um, now I want to show you the late date and triggers. I hope that you got this one part, this previous part right. So let's now move to a more advanced thing. The first thing I'm going to use is something called test stream. The idea of using test stream is to be able to show something like this, like one element having this event time at this given point, but our pipeline, uh, but yeah, arriving to our pipeline a little bit later. This is the same example as, as we had on the on the slide, but I'm using windows of one minutes and 50 seconds uh, late data. So the idea here, I don't want to go too much on, on detail, is that uh, we we can change, we can advance watermarks and processing time, and we can add elements with a particular event time. So for example, this element here will have timestamp, will have event time seven, but our pipeline knew about it at second 10. So it will have three minutes uh, of delay. This one here will have will appear at second 20. Sorry, yeah, we'll have event time 20, but the processing time will be 40. This represents exactly the same as here. So we'll, these three arrives on time, uh, arrives late, but within the allowed latest, and four, it, it's, it's actually dropped. So let me run this. I don't want to forget about this. And what we're going to do is exactly the same as we were doing before, just using a fixed window and a group by key. But as, as you can see here, I added this parameter here, allowed lateness 15, this is 15 seconds. So if I run, I run the cell over here, we will get, let's order this, we will get the elements that arrive on time. So when the window closes, one and two, and the new trigger that it's going to be three. And we can see it here that it arrives late. Very important here is to notice that the window is exactly the same. The window is still from zero to one, even if the element arrives late. Just to see that I'm not lying to anyone in this, if I do this zero, so I'm not allowing any late data, which is the default, now we will only get one and two and three wouldn't appear because it, it's not allowed. We are not allowing any data. 
Uh, as you can see, this has been relatively easy, just a parameter in our in our window function. Now let's move into triggers, which is a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to still use uh, test stream. Uh, I will show you with uh, with a picture of what what this test stream actually looks like. So you, we we can get it a little bit better. So I'm creating six elements, one to six, one to arrive on time, also three and four and five arrive late, but within the late data that we're allowing and six is arriving late. But yeah. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a trigger uh, that is going to be for early firings, I'm going to use this processing time to seconds. So I'm going to count um, 10 seconds after this element one appears and all the elements that belong to this these 10 seconds of processing time are going to be put together. Then the I'm going to get after watermark. So when the window closes, I'm going to get it. And for late data, I'm also going to use after watermark. I will explain what's happening in a second. So again, the trigger is after watermark, which is the default, but we are adding early trigger of processing time, 10 seconds, delay 10. And as a late is after watermark. Um, Nothing else to add, so a lot lateness. We specify the trigger here, and the accumulation mode is going to be discarding. So I'm going to discard the previous fired items. So let's run the cell. And let me order this. So what do we get? So we get one and two. Why? Because of the 10 seconds uh, of after processing time. And we can see that here, the pen info says that it's early. Then we get three. This is because the uh, we, the window is closing. So we fired in this particular moment. And then we get four and five in, a, in different panes. This is because what we are doing is check if this trigger is true whenever any element arrives. So after watermark means, is the window closed? Are we after the window? And the moment that five, uh, four arrives, is it after the window? Yes, it appeared at this time. It didn't appear during this time. So we're firing it. And then, then we ask the same question for five. Are we, is this element after the watermark? Yes, so we fire it. And six, of course, is dropped because we are not allowing it. I'm going to run the same, the same uh, pipeline, but now I'm going to accumulate. accumulate. So I think it's past right? So now we will see how, how it looks like. You can see it's just changing from this card into community very easy. And now let's order this again. We get the same triggers, one and two, then we add three, then we add four, and then we add five. Um, just to finish, I'm going to show you a composite trigger. Uh, the, the stream here doesn't matter so much since I'm going to use a global window. Just the important thing is to know that one comes after two and so on. So what I'm going to do is do first and after count, and then we will see what's happening. So let's run this. OK, I think I have to stop the pilot first. OK, now. And we're getting only one and two. Why is that? The reason of us only getting this one and two is because we are not triggering forever. So if we go to our, um, to our elements, we see that we get two, uh, two elements. So the condition after count two is met. And the rest of the elements are going to be dropped because the trigger, again, after count was already met. So we don't have any trigger anymore. The solution for this is going to be trigger uh, repeatedly. Yes, I hope that's spelled right. And if we run this again, then we stop it first. And now we get everything. We get one and two, three, four, five, six and five. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Why do we get three, four, five? It's after count two, not after count three. The reason of this is because the elements arrive to our system at the same time. So if we go to our stream, we can see that at Timestamp six, as processing time six, we get three elements at once. And even if they have a different time uh, event time, 
the pilot knew about them at the very same time. So we are triggering it together. In reality, this after count is after at least count. Since generally we do, you wouldn't use after count two, you would use maybe a thousand or so, you might get some um, elements arriving to the same time and you might get a thousand and one and so on. This was just an example to exaggerate the, um, the reality. Okay, so now I want to show you what happens if we do after count nine. Remember that we only have seven elements in our pipeline. So let's see what happens. Well, let's wait a little bit, a little bit longer, and infinite longer. We should be waiting forever because it's not going to happen. The reason is, again, we only have seven elements. We're not going to trigger. There's no, the condition of having at least nine elements is not going to be met. So we're not going to fire. How do we fix this? We're going to create another composite trigger. So let me call this a trigger. And we're going to do trigger after any, which is the same as after first. Um, we, we were talking in, in the slides, I was, I was calling after first, but it's the same as after any. I think in Java it's after first, and in Python it's after any. Now, the first condition is going to be after count nine. And then the other trigger is going to be after processing time of a delay of 10 seconds or 11, whatever, and let's do 10. So now we have two conditions. Whenever the condition of having 10, uh, nine elements or waiting uh, 10 seconds since the first one is met, we're firing. Let me just take this out. And just put it here. And if I run this, now this will work if I didn't make any mistake. And now we get them. We get all the elements together because they were fired with this condition over here. And yeah, that was everything that I had for you today. I hope this was clear. Um, if not, I think you will probably have some questions. Um, I think I can read it over there. Uh, I don't know if, um, Brittany, I don't know if you're going to read the questions or should I do it? Yes, I can read the questions for you. So the first one I see is with late events. Oh, let's see, that's not. With late events, window itself get delayed by 15 minutes considering this example? Uh, so it will depend, but it will depend on, on your trigger itself. But uh, the idea is as we, we have been seeing in the, uh, the next slides, the one that probably appear after uh, the question, is that you will trigger when the window closes and then you will trigger with the, with the new late data. So you will have two triggers, the first one for the window itself when it closes, and then you will get new triggers for us as the new late data is, is arriving. Does this answer your question? Yes. <laughs> also a question from Daniel. I see that they have their hand raised. Hey, sir. Daniel, if you'd like to come off your mic, you can actually ask Inigo your question. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, we have a, a question that actually came up in production for us where we're reading from uh, Pub, uh, PubSub. And one thing I noticed is uh, the data from PubSub doesn't always arrive in order. So, you know, if you put order data to PubSub, data flow doesn't necessarily get it in the exact same order. So if you have like a backlog of data that you're trying to run through, do you have to essentially set the allowed lateness to be as long as the latest or the earliest data point you can get? Let's say you're doing like hour windows and you have seven days of data. Sometimes you can get a data point for an hour that, you know, arrives days apart as far as processing timestamp. Does that question make sense? Like, how, how do you account for that and the allowed lateness for the window? So, yeah, um, what, what you said is right. Uh, since the um, the timestamp assigned to, to the element will be when you actually publish the, the element, if you have seven days of, of data in PubSub, 
you start reading from, from the, the subscription, you are going to need to specify this allowed uh, data uh, for, for seven days. So you have to, you, you have to take into consideration um, how this data is compared to your processing system. Uh, I don't know if that makes it clear. So what it will happen is that internally we, uh, BIM will do, it will subdivide the, the time in, in chunks of, of fixed windows. So it will say, okay, the, the elements belong to this particular window, but this particular window happened seven days ago. And since, since we are not allowing the data, I'm going to drop all the elements that are seven days old. If you are allowing the, the late data, it should process them fine. Uh, as a general idea, um, I shouldn't, I wouldn't recommend you to leave elements in PubSub for so long. If you have that backlog in PubSub, one approach can be to use BATS, uh, like a pipeline uh, from, uh, sorry, uh, to, to, to read everything and, and write it to, um, to a bucket or something, and then you can read from, the, from that without considering the, the late data itself, instead of doing aggregation by the way. That makes a lot of sense. It's just sometimes, <clears throat> like we had a system, situation where the system, our pipeline went down for a couple of days. And then when we had brought it back up again, it was processing really old data, but uh, I understand what you're saying. Cool. Oh, all right. Sorry, since no one else asked, are, is this notebook going <laughs> to be available somewhere uh, for, for us or something similar? Uh Actually, I didn't think of making this uh, like available, but I will talk with Brittany or with Alma just to see if we can make it uh, available. The reason is like is that uh, as you can see, my notes here are very like I almost had no notes because I was just doing this for myself and for you to explain. Um, but yeah, I, I think we can make it available somehow. Um, either way, there was a session. I think it was one month or something ago of, uh, it was being college, if I recall correctly. They, they had a similar session for this, uh, not with the same approach, but they also created a, a notebook that you can get. If you look for being college windows or triggers or something like that, you just will find it. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, no props. I do see another question. Does after count to trigger means when two elements from the same key arrives in the window, the trigger will fire? So it, it, it will depend on how you're uh, aggregating later. So if, if your aggregation is by key, then yes, it will mean like when two elements from with the same key arrive uh, together, you will get them. But if you have uh, different keys and you're aggregating by key, it you will need to have them with the same key. So if, for example, element A arrive, arrives, element B arrives, and then element A arrives, you will only trigger for A and B. A, a, a and A, you wouldn't trigger for B. Does it make sense? Yes. Great. <laughs> Uh, okay, apparently there's another question that we missed, especially for data flow, how great are these time sets across compute engine instances? I don't really have like a super definitive answer, um, but I would say like very accurate. Um, I haven't seen any issue on my side. Like it, it, ideally like the code is running on docking containers on, 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 the, on, the, on the VM, so it's not, exactly happening on, on the VM itself. But I, I, I would say like they're quite uh, accurate. Maybe like you get like a tiny millisecond off, but I haven't experienced anything like that. Uh, maybe there is, I, 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 unfortunately I cannot promise anything, uh, but um, I haven't gotten any problem with, with, with that. Is there any, any data? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, is there any data size based trigger there? Um, I guess you mean like if, for example, like 
10 elements have a size of, I don't know, two megabytes to five, something like that. Is that what you mean? If so, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. You can create your own your own triggers. The, the same way that you create custom uh, custom windows, you can create your own, your own triggers. I don't think there's anything in particular for this already previewed. Uh, you, you could do it. So the SDK is very flexible with pretty much everything. And if you do, feel free to submit it to, to Beam for, for the new versions. But as far as I know, the, the, they are not available. An approach that you could have here is using what I mentioned earlier of stateful do functions. So you can, uh, the, the idea basically is that you have a place where you store your elements. And what you could do is just check if the bug, which is the place that you're storing these elements, is at least this this particular size, uh, and if so, you fire everything. But as a trigger per se, I don't think it exists already. Are there any other questions from Aniga? All right, I'll ask one more if, if I'm allowed. I don't <laughs> want to monopolize. <laughs> um, please do, so please do. My, is my understanding correct? Then again, this back to light data. If you want to, if you're allowing light data and you're accumulating, and you essentially want the uh, collection that has all of the data, you just want the pane with the largest number in that case. So they say the, the because what I've seen is you, you get, um, you know, a, a pain, you get a window. And then you get multiple panes potentially after that window with the late data that did arrive. And if you just kind of always want to get the, the, you know, the file or whatever it is that has all the data, would that be the, the latest pane, the largest pane number? I'm not 100% sure that I get your question. Is it like uh, you are keeping all the elements until uh, like forever? Is that your question? No, Until, like, the later I think you, you had an example in the notebook and I don't know exactly which one it was, but um, um, there was one that yeah, showed so. multiple panes towards, uh, so yeah, it, was, I think it, it was said so, pain yeah. one. I think it was over this, over here. Yeah, yeah this here, one, right? here, for instance, pain three late. So that, that has all the elements. It has one, two, mm -hmm. three, four allowed and five allowed. So is that a general, uh, is that generally correct that like the, pain number, whatever largest will be the one that contains all the data if you're accumulating? Oh, yes, of course. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Okay. So when, when you're accumulating, um, so every time like you file your, your trigger, it will count as a new pain. And the latest one will have, um, like it will have all the elements before you're accumulating. In fact, uh, I don't think I have it like with here now, with me now, but when you are fighting triggers and you get a window that is closed, if you check the, so there's something called uh, pain information within a do function. So when you're checking this do function and the window is already closed, it will tell you, like when is the last trigger, sorry, it will tell you, is this the, the last pain? And you will say yes. So. Uh, let me explain it again because I think my explanation was very wrong. So when you're getting the elements from from an, an aggregation that uses triggers, if one of the paints is the latest one, it will. If you check the the, the paint information of that particular element, it will tell you if that's the last paint file or not. Does this answer your question? I know my, my explanation yeah. wasn't the best. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. It's just we, we're in a situation we always want the last pane. That's all we care about is the last one. So I was just wondering if there's a general way to know. Yes. Uh, I, again, I don't have it here, but if you go to the documentation, uh, when you do your Pardu, maybe I have some Pardu over here. I don't. Uh, so the idea, just let me write it over here. So when you have your Pardu, you do class, something, something. Do function. I'm, I'm making this up. Um, and then you have dev process. And then you do element, which is your element. Oh, sorry. 
the tolerant, and there's something that you do like train equal. I I don't know for sure how it is, but it's going to like do function pattern info something like that. Oh, pain info, sorry. Something like this. So if you do something like this, then you can access the pain. And if you can check if it's the the, the last pane on of, of that window. Great. This All might right, be wrong, by the way. So just, just check I it in the documentation because I don't remember everything. Okay. Thank you. No problems. All right. Well then I just want to thank you so much. That was a great presentation, Nigo. Um and I just wanted to remind everyone um, that we do value all of your feedback. And so if you wouldn't mind filling out the form and the link is in the chat that you'll see. And then um, we just wanna also remind you to not forget to remember uh, not forget to register for next week's um, session of the Beam Learning Month, which would be the last session this month, where we will learn how to use Java transforms in a multi-language uh, Python pipeline. And with that, thank you again, Nigo, and thank you all for attending. We'll see you next week. Bye.